It's Heritage Week here in Merlin Woods. I'm with Ruth Hennessy of Vincent Wildlife Trust and we're here to explore the mammals and we're looking for tracks and signs around the woodlands. And we're very excited. We're so excited. Thank you, Caroline, and thanks to Friends of Merlin Woods for having me today. So, Vincent Wildlife Trust in Ireland focus on the Pine Martin, the Stoat and the Lesser Horseshoe Bat. But here during Heritage Week in Merlin Woods, we are looking at all of the mammals. We've been looking at mammals from small to large and see can we find them by their tracks and signs. We met last night and we put out some longworth traps, which are live traps for small mammals. Now we're going to talk about some of the other species that you find here. Merlin Woods is a haven for wildlife with a rich array of habitats, from meadows to broadleafed and coniferous woodlands, and we have been exploring them to see what we can find. So, we know that we find red squirrels here, they're a flagship species in County Galway. We also get pine marten here, the very elusive pine marten, so we're going to talk about how you can find that using the signs it leaves, like scats. We know that you've got stoat here, you've also got rabbits, foxes, badgers, pygmy shrew, at least five species of bats, and there's loads of information at the end of the video on how you can see more on these animals in Ireland. So this is the native red squirrel. The red squirrels have been in Ireland for thousands of years. Sometimes in spring and summer, you may see one with a more blonde tail, but they've got this beautiful red color, red ear tufts, and they're arboreal, which means that they like to be up off the ground in trees. And we'll talk more about how you can spot them later on. Merlin Woods is really important in that red squirrels can survive and thrive here, which is fantastic in an area that's so close to a city like Galway. So, last year NUI Galway conducted an All-Ireland Squirrel and Pine Martin survey, where we asked members of the public to send in their sightings of those three species to the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and this gave us a huge amount of information. It helped us to look at what was happening of the, with the interaction between these three species in the country. Many people are aware with the fact that grey squirrel numbers have been crashing, particularly in the Midlands of Ireland. So this study looked at what was happening and it was found that the numbers have continued to crash and this has spread to adjacent counties. And when this happened, it allowed red squirrels to return to some of these woodlands and people were seeing them who hadn't seen them in 20 or 30 years. So it's been a fantastic result. However, interestingly, this has been linked to the occurrence of the pine marten. So it was found that in certain woodlands where there was a certain density of pine marten, it enabled the, the grey squirrel to be driven out and the red squirrel to return. So we're watching this very closely and really excited and enthused to see the effect it's having on a native species that, that was being pushed out by the grey squirrel. So this is the pine marten also in Ireland for thousands of years. It's a mustelid, which means it comes from the weasel family. Pine martens are about the size of a cat. They are also arboreal, which means they like to be off the ground, up in trees. They have bushy fur, a long bushy tail, darker underneath, and they're fantastic climbers. They're really comfortable off the ground. They're, they're fantastic in a three-dimensional complex habitat. They've got cream lining their ears, and the way you can ensure you've seen a pine marten other than something that might be similar like a mink is this cream coloured bib patch. Now this cream coloured bib is unique to each individual sort of like a fingerprint so if you were to see a pine marten or to photograph or film one on a trail camera you can see if it is the same one that's returning by this pattern. So they're an important part of our natural ecosystem. Pine martens are opportunistic, they'll eat whatever is locally abundant so in autumn they make great use of berries and fruit They'll take carrion, especially in winter. They'll tug small mammals or birds or eggs and even amphibians like frogs in some areas. And we're going to talk about their scats later on and how you can use those to detect what they've been eating. Pine martens are solitary animals, which means that the male and female only come together to mate. They don't live in family groups like foxes or badgers, for example. Pine martens give birth to two to three kits in April. Vincent Wildlife Trust and the National Parks and Wildlife Service have put together a website called pinemartin.ie where you can access loads of information about this native species. And this is the Irish stoat. The Irish stoat is endemic to Ireland, which means that it's only found in Ireland and also interestingly in the Isle of Man. As you can see, it's a good deal smaller than the pine martin and it's also a member of the weasel family. In the UK and the rest of Europe, stoats have a straight belly line dividing this upper and lower coloured fur. In Ireland it's irregular and that's thought to be because we lack lots of ground-lying snow. 
The stoat in Ireland doesn't turn white in winter like that across Europe because again of our lack of snow. A way to tell a stoat from something that might be similar is this, the black tail tip, and it's indicative of the species. Stoats confuse their prey with a series of leaping, acrobatic movements. Stoats, like many mustelids, run with a kind of a loping movement, very low to the ground. Mustelids often have a long body with short legs, and stoats will often take over the burrows of their prey species afterwards for denning in. One of the ways we can study elusive mammals is through non-invasive monitoring and by collecting droppings, for example scats from a pine marten or sprains from an otter, these can be analysed for their DNA and their DNA can tell us so much, it can tell us the species, whether they're male or female and the individual. So this is a great way that we can actively look at where animals and where an individual is, in, is existing along a river system or in a woodland without actually having hold of the animal itself. So Caroline, this is our Longworth live mammal trap and it has two compartments. This is the nest box and this is the tunnel. And what we do is we create a nice safe habitat for the animal so that it's, it's safe and secure with food over the period that we've, we've trapped it. And then we can come along in the morning and check it and see what we've got. Now these Longworth traps have a hole in the back. You can see it there. It's a very small hole and that's in the trap so that a pygmy shrew can escape. Pygmy shrews are our smallest mammals. They're protected by law and you'd have to have a license to trap them. Pygmy shrews are also insectivores. So if we were trapping pygmy shrews, we would need to, to put in insect prey like um, blowfly pupae. And we would also need to check the traps every two to three hours because pygmy shrews have to eat every two to three hours. They have a very high tap metabolism and they're also very nervous. So something like being caught in a trap could be enough to kill a pygmy shrew um, because they're, they're very nervous animals that are always on the go. So this is the precaution we take with the shrew hole. So first we put in a nice, nice amount of hay and we put that not too much but just enough in here as bedding and then we add a nice wee meal for our animal. We add here some oats, just some porridge, a little handful of porridge. I have some apples from the tree and these are great because they add moisture so the animal isn't going to be dehydrated over the night. They'll keep it um, with a little bit of water and then we add some protein so some peanuts and not too much food but just enough that we could um, for kind of the maximum length of time that, that the, anim the trap could have an animal it could trap one five minutes before we get to it or it could trap one five minutes after we put it out so we're always thinking of the the welfare of the animal so the way it works is when the animal goes into the trap like so it walks down along and it steps on a treadle and when it does the door goes down so we have to make sure that none of our food gets stuck under the treadle because it'll block it and then the animal goes into the nest box and stays there safely until we come along so we attach the tunnel to the nest box like so so it's quite secure and then you can see that there's a bit of an angle here so we will always set our trap with this part um, parallel to the ground and this is so that if it's very wet, it is promised very wet tomorrow morning around 6am, any water that gets into the trap will run out and won't sit here making the bedding all wet. It's also really important that we keep the trap protected from any direct sunlight so this aluminium box won't get hot and also if I knew there was going to be very cold or frosty conditions I wouldn't be setting a trap because that would be unbearable for the animal. So only in, in kind of um, mild conditions like we have at the moment but we would take precaution that it doesn't get too hot or doesn't get too cold and that's essentially it and when we come along tomorrow we will see if the door is down and if it is hopefully we'll have a small mammal now it could have been that a snail got in and triggered the trap and went out through the, the, the shrew hole or it could be that a pygmy shrew got in and left again so sometimes the door closed doesn't mean you have an animal but we're hopeful that we will um, and then when we set the traps, we will mark the site, we'll take a GPS reading so that we can make sure we find the trap in the morning. And we normally set our traps in pairs. And we'd also use some tin foil that we'll put on a, a bit of a branch or a leaf to guide us to the site. Now we need to have a few ways of finding the trap in case someone removed the tin foil or it blew away. And we'll take it with us tomorrow so that we're not leaving any litter. So we can come along and check our traps. 
And what we'll look for is we will be looking for small mammals need cover. They need a lot of cover to protect them from things that want to eat them like barn owls or birds of prey or stoats um, or pine martens. So we'll be looking for areas of nice thick long grass, nice thick cover where they're well protected and we'll peel apart the grass and look for little runs within the habitat, within the vegetation and these little runs and tunnels are used by things like bank folds and wood mice. So we'll head off now, it's, it's dusk, it's a beautiful night and we'll go find some good habitat for our traps. So Ruth, can you tell me why you picked this spot? I picked this spot because it's full of moss and moss provides great cover and also this lovely stone ditch. Between the ditch and the moss there's a lot of little tunnels in between so for a small mammal there's an awful lot of cover here. Also because of the, the plants growing in this woodland there's also good food for wildlife so the small mammals that we're looking at will eat things like fungi, um, seeds, fruit, gra um, grasses so there's a lot going on in here and I think it would have the cover the, the food source and the protection from predators. Yeah. So I see some nice little gaps here. Brilliant. And, but also I'm looking for somewhere I can secrete the trap quite well. So, and that might might be kind of on the run of a mammal as we're walking through. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking for some of these, these um, nice little runs that a small mammal could access as it was going between the rocks. underneath. So I'm going to put this you one found in here. One, yeah. I found one, yeah. Indeed, I, I like the look of it. The trap is well hidden out of sight and and then when I have it set I'm just going to do another check to make sure that the gate hasn't gone down on its own, the door. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get um, a piece of tinfoil now and What I'll do is I'll mark this, um, let me see, one of the leaves here with tin for it. But what I'll also do is when I go back to the path, I'll mark on the path so that we know to come down here to check the trap. Brilliant. And I'm going to take a GPS point so that we can find it tomorrow. This will be accurate to within one or two metres mm -hmm. though we're in the woods. Yeah. So I'll get it fixed and this will be the first one. Now I like to them in pairs because then you're getting a good feel for the area. So I see some nice tunnels across there. I don't want anything too big because I don't want something that that a fox or a larger mammal will be going into because that's not going to be very appealing to a very small mammal. They'll yeah, probably yeah, avoid yeah. it. Absolutely. So something just small mammal size. So there's nice um, roots of a tree up here. Yeah. It could be a good place for, for an animal. So a wood mouse, for example, will use underground tunnels and some of them will be nest chambers. Okay. Some of them will be food stores. So it's going to be using a nice system um, that, that you'd find kind of there's a lot of space in here under the rocks. Yeah. Whereas a bank fold will probably form runs just underneath the grass. So it wouldn't necessarily use tunnels to the same extent. Um, so I'm hoping this might be good wood mouse, wood mouse territory. Brilliant. So I've got some apple here and I'm going to put it in a little tray leading up to the trap so that I can hopefully entice an animal in that they will smell the apple um, and hopefully find the trap where there's more food. So I'm just going to move this gently and place the apple down in front. Check that the door is still open and I've secured it under a root so that it stays in place. There we go. And we might even see a little nose in the morning there. Mm. So I'm going to take my GPS now and mark it um, as our first trap. M for Merlin. And this is the, the last way that we'll be able to be sure that we have the right location in the morning. So we think we've got a second site over here. Yep. We have our trap. Oh, there's the nice trap there. The there you go. Thanks, Caroline. That's the one. So there's a nice big space under this root system and then the, this leads down. I don't know if you can see there, yeah. it just leads down in under the tree. It's not too big so I'm hoping it's not for a bigger animal. Um, it's been raining so it will have washed away any droppings or signs but we'll talk about that in the morning and we'll pop this in. I'll just get some of the apple to leave a little, a little incentive. And We'll pop this in here 
facing towards the gap. And now this is a really good spot because there's lots of moss that we can cover up our track because we don't want that to go missing. We have to make sure we find it in the morning, but we want to make sure that it's, it's still here when we get here. So the door is open. And it's I'm great, and you hardly know it was there at all. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't. You just have to make sure that you, you find it. Yeah. Um, so we'd have our little telltale um, piece of tinfoil, and we'll add this tinfoil back up to the path when we get there. And we'll take another GPS point right here. So. This is our, our second one. And these are fantastic. They'll even show us the route that we took to get here when we come back in the morning. So, Brilliant. let's go and set two more in a different type of habitat. Great stuff. We're here in the, on the main path of Merlin Park Woods and Ruth's going to explain to you why she picked this area for her next trap. Well, I chose this area over to my right because we have such a big variation in size of plants. So we have the very small ground layer moving up to um, shrubs, grasses, and right back into brambles and the trees behind. So what I'm always looking for is cover. And if we go further on down, the grass is shorter. Here we have some taller herbs, but not very much under them. And I think for, for mammals, the brambles are great. They'll always provide berries and fruit. Um, and we've just got a nice variation and, and a lot of it's quite thick so I'm going to have to peel apart the grass okay. and look underneath and, and probably get scratched by brambles and stung by nettles but I'll be able to, to hopefully find some little runs underneath so that's really what, what attracted me it's, it's that it's thick cover and, and that's what's so, so nice about an area like this is that it's, it's not just one type of plant it's not just a monoculture it's not just mown grass which is yeah. Of, of no use for wildlife whatsoever but you've got this real nice dense um, habitat going on so Brilliant. this is the spot thanks very okay but this is absolutely perfect when i pull apart these grasses and gently move these brambles there's a whole world in there there's so much space there are big big tunnels that a small mammal would, if you look in there, there's so much protection. Now, ideally, the, the tunnels would be much smaller, but there's a lot of space that you can imagine um, small mammals running back and forth, being able to get by in here, get access to food like these berries, um, seeds from the grasses, whatnot, without any risk from predation. And um, so this is a lovely spot, and I'm going to put a trap in here. So I'm going to get my little handful of... Apples to put in for, and then I'm going to pop in the trap. These sites are a bit of a health hazard because there's a lot of uh, brambles going on here. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to lay the tunnel flat, have a check of the entrance to make sure it's up. It's a very gentle mechanism so it doesn't take much for it to fall down and then I can perfectly conceal it like that which is very helpful and then get a little piece of tin foil where we can be sure to find it in the you morning. You could imagine that you'd lose them quite easily if you hadn't got some kind of marker in oh, an area like this. And that it's such a fear because if you lost one with an animal you know it, it's unimaginable what that would would do so the, the biggest thing is to make sure you can find them again and you know if you don't find it look keep looking keep looking and if you went for one of the reasons I would avoid a run that was too big is it could be a fox run and a fox could run through maybe there could be an animal that could smell it it could take it or a dog either if there's a lot of activity from, from people with dogs or an animal could hit it out of the way yeah. and that's happened to us before and we were so long looking for the trap um, and found it and you always have to ensure you find it so I'd avoid anything that was likely to be a bigger animal if it looked like a badger might have passed through um, but that's nice it's it's concealed enough that I feel like it's just good for the smaller ones Brilliant. so I'm going to have a little look along and see where else I can put the second trap so we're back it's the following morning it's a lovely damp 
um, warm morning and we're at our first trap. So we found the tin foil along the path. We've come down here to our next piece of tin foil which we're going to remove. And if we take away our camouflage, we have our Longworth trap. Now sometimes, looking at the shrew hole, you can see a, a little animal's um, nose there. So we're just going to gently take it out so that we don't knock apart the mechanism. We can see the door is closed and it feels slightly heavy. So we know that there's likely to be something in here. That's the back of it. What we do is first we gently lift up the... Oh, and we can see there's something in there. And I have an idea what it is. So sometimes the mammal is in the tunnel itself. But what we have here is we have made a little area to put our animals. So we're going to release it now and see what we have and talk That's about it. it. The tunnel is free. So it's in the nest box. It's obviously quite comfy. So we're just going to take out the straw and we have... Oh! <laughs> we have a bank vole. Okay. This is a bank vole. Bank voles were found in Ireland in the mid 60s and they were believed to have been brought into Ireland in the 20s in soil and equipment from Germany that came as part of the building of the Arden Crusher power station. So they're technically a non-native species. So they were first found in Kerry and they've since spread across um, the lower third of the country. So generally an arc from Waterford as far as Mayo. And um, as you can see, they're reddish brown with small eyes, small ears that are tucked in and a short tail. So hopefully we'll see a wood mass shortly and we can look at the difference between them. So a very small little animal, you can see it there against, against my hand, just a small little, little, little um, uh, mammal. They're actually pretty good climbers. They can climb up a couple of feet to get to berries and they'll take fruit and berries and seeds and grasses. They tend to, when I was setting traps and I was looking for little runs, little tunnels under the grass, it was these I was thinking of because they, they don't necessarily use nests but they, they use little runs and tunnels along the grass. They've become an important part of the diet of many of the larger animals in Ireland, particularly things like barn owls, other birds of prey, um, stoats. So they've they've become, as you can see, they'd be quite a nutritious food source yeah. for a larger animal. And um, we tend to find them in, we've set along this dry ditch, so woodlands like this and um, grasslands would be a great place to find bank foals. So really lovely little animals. Um, they wouldn't live very long, they probably wouldn't see two winters. So if we look at the bank foal, we can see that it's, um, as I said, it's got small eyes. They tend to be active day and night, so they're not strictly nocturnal species. And scent is very important to them. The males actually track the female through scent. Um, so they're very interesting little animals. Last night when we were down the path setting traps, we looked up and we saw a fox running from a path through here, across the track, and right in here under the tree, into the undergrowth. So we followed the path in and we put up a trail camera overnight. We're going to go in now and retrieve the camera and see if we have any footage on it. So last night we followed the trail in here and we set our trail camera up on this tree here covered in ivy. We have it camouflaged so hopefully you can spot it. So this is all about learning to be a mammal detective and trail cameras are a really important part of that. So much of our wildlife is elusive and many species are nocturnal. So unless we can find them through tracks and trails and prints, we don't know that they're there. Trail cameras let us monitor and look for wildlife without interfering with it. So let's go now and look at our camera and see if we did pick up that fox, perhaps traveling back through this same path. So I'm just going to check the camera now. I've taken it down and see if we captured any footage last night after we set it up. We do. We have eyes. Let's see what this is. So many animals like cows, sheep, deer, 
and many carnivores have a reflective membrane in their eye and when light shines on it, it shines back in a specific colour. For foxes this is orange, for pine martens it's a brilliant blue. So when you see an animal at night time and perhaps in the torchlight, this can give us a clue to what it is. An animal with an eye very close to the ground could be a deer species feeding on some grass. Something like I've seen here about this high is hopefully a fox. So these are all clues to help us figure out what it isn't and then start to figure out what animal it is. So if this was for scientific research, we would examine the animal to see what kind of condition it's in. We would look for any ticks on its coat. We would be able to check whether it's male or female, and this is a male. We would measure the animal, its body length and also its tail length and the length of its hind feet. We would weigh it, and they're essentially the main biometrics we would take. This is our little bank fall. You can see there the length of its tail is quite short and the length of its body. So now we're going to release this little bank fall back into the vegetation where we found it. It's so cute. <laughs> Places like this are superb for wildlife. Even just to look at this, it's just a feast for the senses. The colours are beautiful. We have lovely shades of purples and creams. There's a lovely scent off these flowers. And this verge will change throughout the seasons. Here we are in August, so we can see it's a real array of colours. We have tufted vetch, we have meadowsweet, we have purple loosestrife. And it's not just gorgeous to look at, it's gorgeous for pollinators. It's fantastic for small mammals. Um, this is the kind of habitat we're looking for. So you can imagine um, the, the difference between an area of short mown grass where there's no cover and there's no food. And they're essentially what, what animals need, food and cover, to something like this where there's endless amounts of both of those. And as we move in through, towards the woodland, we have lines of bracken moving into our hazel trees and then our nice ivy covered trees. So there's just a variety. And that's one of the most important things for wildlife and for nature, variety. So we're talking about native species mixes not monocultures of one type but a mix like this and it's such a rich place and such a wonderful place to spend time also So this is a wood mouse. You can see its long pointed nose, its long whiskers at the end of its nose. It's got a long tail and large hind feet. This is a male. It uses its large hind feet for jumping. It's an excellent jumper. It's got fantastic eyesight and you see from its large eyes that it's a nocturnal species. So these large eyes help it to see at night time. These are incredible little animals. The males communicate with the females through ultrasound. Um, wood mice use an extensive system of burrows and within that they have an area for storing food and a separate area for nesting. They don't live very long, they, most will only see one winter. They have, their long tail has skin that can be shed, so if this skin was grabbed by a predator, for example a bird of prey, it would shed the outside of the skin and then that part of the tail would wither and drop off. And for this reason we would also never grab an animal like a wood mouse by the tail. But again, then we wouldn't grab any animal by the tail because that would hurt it. So this is perfect habitat for a wood mouse. It likes mature deciduous woodland, long grassland and it prefers hedgerows. And Ireland is one of the most amazing places for hedgerows. We have over 450,000 kilometres of hedgerows. Hedgerows are incredibly important in this country because we have a very limited supply of woodland, especially mixed and broadleafed woodland. So hedgerows are like linear woodlands and they're really what allows a lot of our wild animals to survive here. So our hedgerows are really, really important. So the wood mouse is a very special animal in Ireland. It's one of the most important animals in the Irish countryside. And this is because of the way it feeds its fantastic disperser of seeds. And also it itself provides a really important source of food for animals like birds of prey, pine martens and stoats. It's been here since the Mesolithic, which is 9,000 years ago. So it's been here for an incredibly long time. So we're here in the conifer part of Merlin Woods and we are in search of red squirrels. Red squirrels are a really iconic species in Ireland and thankfully in recent years they've been making a recovery. It can be very hard to see red squirrels and as mammal detectives we look for ways to find them without actually spotting them. So when you come into an area like this you could listen 
we might be listening for something like a pine cone dropping to the ground. It could be dropped by a squirrel high in the treetops. They are arboreal species, so they're generally off the ground, up high in the trees. Alternatively, you could hear a couple of squirrels having a, a playing or having a scuffle, so you'd hear them running around at the top of the trees. So do make sure you listen when you're looking for animals, but then look down and see if there are any signs on the ground. We've just found some. We found these scales. So we're going to look around because it's likely that a squirrel would have peeled these off a cone, like a Sitka spruce cone. So we're going to see what else we can find. So this is fantastic. We've found some real telltale squirrel signs. Not only do we have lots of the scales, we have our cones here. So the squirrel will have peeled those off the outside. And in addition, on the tree here, we have some hazelnuts. So we can tell that this, these are signs of a squirrel because they're split in half by the insides of the animal. Other animals like bankfolds or woodmouse would eat hazelnuts as well, but they would cut a small hole in around the top and through the markings on that hole we could tell whether it was a wood mouse or a bank foal. But these have been split cleanly in half, so are obvious red squirrel signs. So we not, may not see a red squirrel today, but this is a telltale sign that they've been here and are in this area of woodland. So in addition to these holes going in down here underneath the stump, this would be a great place to set up a trail camera. Red squirrels cache food for the winter, so they will store their their um, hazelnuts somewhere they can go back during the leaner colder months and avail of a good food source. Red squirrels are typically in higher densities in mixed broadleaf woodland. However, in conifer habitats like this, they can survive. And where red squirrels and grey squirrels coexist, the grey squirrels don't do well in conifer habitats like this, so red squirrels tend to be able to last there. So it's not their ideal habitat, but they seem to be able to have, have managed in some of these forests. Now this is fantastic as a conifer woodland because it's also got some great broadleaf species. The hazel that we see here, and we also have a lot more light getting in, so we've got lovely understory, so it's not a thick plantation, and it's not too dark, so we can get a lot of other species growing up amongst it. So here we are trying to be mammal detectives and there's a fantastic resource we can use which is the late Rob Strachan's book Mammal Detectives and it's full of brilliant tips and techniques on how to improve your chances of seeing and tracking wild mammals. So for example we know that there are red squirrels here, we found very recent signs. So what we might do is come back very early in the morning, make sure we're very quiet if ever we're watching mammals, they have a fantastic sense of smell, much better than us. So it's really important to stay downwind of them. Wear dark clothes like this, clothes that are very silent, so you're not rustling and startling them. Things like snow or wet, muddy riverbanks are really useful for tracking footprints, especially if they're fresh. Now we don't get a lot of snow in Ireland and we get a lot of rain which washes away footprints. So this can be quite difficult, but it's a really useful way to look at where an animal was what type of animal, which direction it was going. Another really valuable way of tracking mammals are signs. And the signs are feeding signs like this, or scats and sprints and droppings. So for example, if we were in a woodland like this and we were trying to track a pine marten, we might look for a pine marten scat, which is the dropping. The best place to look for a pine marten scat is along a track like this, or the main track out here. Animals leave droppings to mark their territory and to communicate. So if they're marking territory, often it's on a path. So paths are great places to look because it could be the dividing line between, for example, an adult male fox on either side. So this is a gorgeous area of conifer habitat. We have lovely dead wood, we have ferns, and we have this great old mossy stone wall these are brilliant. If I was trying to put up a trail camera to look for an animal like, a, like an Irish stoat, I would set it looking at this. Stoats are very difficult to track. They don't leave droppings like scats that we can find easily. Um, they're very, very elusive animals. So a trail camera on a habitat like this would be a great way of seeing if there was stoat activity in the area. If we were looking for, some, for something like a pine marten, we would look for a scat, which is a pine marten dropping. Now pine martens are arboreal, like red squirrels. They like to be off the ground in the trees. Um, and they will use high features like a stone wall or a fallen log to run along. And they'll often scat on those high features. So I might check a wall, I might take, check a tree stump or a fallen log for the scats. By looking at the scats, I can tell what the pine marten has eaten. It might have berries or seeds. It might have bones of a small mammal. So they're great clues as to what's there and how it's been acting. 
Other animals we might expect in areas like this are badgers, rabbits, we can look for droppings. A lot of these animals are nocturnal, like hedgehogs, so often you might see them via trail camera. If you see a hedgehog during the day, that's not a good sign. It's lovely and quiet here at the moment, but if I was to suddenly hear alarm calls of a bird, like for example a jay, it would alert me to think that there may be a predator in the area. So maybe that a fox is passing through or a marten is nearby. So it's worth keeping your eyes and ears open. Now when we do find something like a scat, it's also very useful to smell it. Smell is a great way to figure out what a dropping belongs to. Now do this carefully and obviously wash your hands afterwards. But a pine martin scat is a very sweet scent. It's indicative, its shape is indicative of it being pine martin. It tends to be small with a little bit of a twist at the end. A fox, a, a scat from a fox is much bigger and tends to have a much muskier smell. Additionally, if you were by the, by the sea or by a river and you would find an otter sprained, they tend to have a, a very strong smell of jasmine, very like jasmine tea. Alternatively, the droppings left by something like an American mink smell very, very strong, a very strong odour and very musky. So these are all ways we can learn to distinguish between animals just by finding what they leave behind for us in their habitat. And researching mammals is something everyone can get involved with. It's really important when people see an animal, whether it's a red squirrel, a wood mouse or a fox, to send their sighting in to the National Biodiversity Data Centre. The website is biodiversityireland.ie and there's also a fantastic app called Biodiversity Data Capture. So if you see the animal, you can record it straight away. You might even have a photograph you can upload. And by sending in these sightings, which is called citizen science, we can create maps and look at how trends have changed in where certain species are found in Ireland over time. It's incredibly important and really valuable. And this goes for roadkill as well as for live sightings. There are two mammal surveys underway in Ireland at the moment, and both are based in Galway. Elaine from NUI Galway is researching hedgehogs with the Irish Hedgehog Survey. So if you see a hedgehog in your garden, even roadkill along the road, please send in your sighting to the National Biodiversity Data Centre or by following the Facebook page and Twitter pages of the Irish Hedgehog Survey. The second one is from Emma who's also in NUI Galway and Emma is studying squirrels, red squirrels, in the urban areas of Galway and this is the Galway Red Squirrel Project. Again, if you see any red squirrels, if you're in woodlands like this in Merlin Woods or in Terryland Forest Park or anywhere within Galway City, please send in your sightings to Emma via the Facebook page or Twitter page or through the website of the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Thanks a million, Ruth. That's been a fantastic evening, morning, afternoon. We've seen loads of small mammals and we've learned so much about different mammals through the tracks and trails and it's been so exciting. Can you mm -hmm. tell us more about Vincent Wildlife Trust? and where we can find out more information. Well, people can go to our website, which is vincentwildlife.ie, or also find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and there's a wealth of information on there. And thank you, Colin and Caroline, and Friends of Merlin Woods. It's been a superb um, celebration of Heritage Week, and we've really found so many signs of mammals and seen them in the hand. So really hope everyone enjoys this video, and also the links that you find at the end. Thank you, and if you want to find out more about Friends of Merlin Woods, you can check us out on Facebook, you can look at YouTube, Twitter, Instagram as well. Thank you.